And so it's not about, it's not about forcing my wife and my kids to be subservient to me. It's about serving them well. Like I've never felt like Jesus forced me to be subservient to him. I'm called to submit just like he was called to submit to the father. And so, um, you know, doing that well is really difficult. Loving my my wife is Christ is love the church. That's one of the hardest things, maybe the hardest thing that I'm called to do in life. It's incredibly difficult. And so, so I'm, I'm called to be that first, uh, you know, I'm, I'm called to, I'm called to protect and provide. And so I think that most men uh, struggle with either sinful, probably ambition, they become workaholics or sinful passivity and they're lazy and want to play video games. And but one of the things that I am seeing from the Christian community, from the even the very well uh, grounded theological Christian community is that they believe in this idea of biblical masculinity and biblical patriarchy or headship and how to do this well. And they're doing some of it well, but on the physical side, you know, I go to these Christian conferences, there's a lot of dudes walking around at 400 pounds. You're right. And they, they believe what I'm saying. They're like, yeah, I know I need to, I know I need to get in shape. I know I need, like, no, you don't understand. Like you're going to die and leave right. your family and not be able to protect, provide, be a priest or king because you're not going to be here. And Make so, your escape. Welcome to Lasting Light Leadership Podcast, where we are operating by the standard set in Mark 9.35, where Jesus says, he who wants to be first will be last of all and servant of all. Contrary to popular belief, servant leadership is not weak leadership. On the contrary, we are trying to model and reflect the character of Christ and serve as he did. So we are here at Last in Line to empower and equip you to find the leader within yourself that empowers other people and encourages other people, that serves other people. So we're glad you're here. Settle in to this episode and enjoy your time here at Last in Line Leadership. Hey, today we are honored to have a wonderful guest full of knowledge, full of wisdom, full of experience in the world of physical fitness, strength training, powerlifting, and we're inviting Matt Reynolds, uh, who is the CEO and founder of Barbell Logic. Matt's a Christian. He's a father. He's a husband. Um, it, it, Barbell Logic has become one of the largest online coaching companies in the world. He has 25 years of experience competing at uh, high level in strength sports, coaching, um, barbell-based be- strength and conditioning. Um, he's had a lifelong pursuit um, of knowledge in this area. He he learned he earned his elite level status as a power lifter, uh, professional strongman. Um, he has created this business to really help other people and serve other people, and that's what this podcast is about servant leadership and that's what he's doing he's equipping people to live better lives longer lives healthier lives Um, his business is focused on redefining traditional personal training uh, by creating connections in the online space Uh, gives people uh, a chance to access through their smart devices uh, professional coach uh, nutrition coach strength Uh, but he's basically forging opportunities uh, in the world uh, for the world to experience a life of improved strength and voluntary hardship. So I'm interested to dig into his faith, how he became a Christian, his background, some of his heroes, what he learned that leadership was coming up through the ranks, um, just his take on masculinity and what the world is feeding us and what the Bible talks about. And we're also going to dig into his company, Barbell Logic the dynamics of the programs, the uniqueness of his approach and and what he offers to the world. So I am excited. This is going to be selfishly a benefit to me because I'm going to learn a little bit more about strength training that I didn't already know. But I want to welcome to the stage from Barbell Logic, Matt Reynolds to Last in Line Podcast. Matt Reynolds from Barbell Logic, welcome to Last in Line Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on the show, man. Excited to do it. Yeah, man, it's, it, it's exciting to reach out to people and and you know via 
other podcasts that I listen to. Uh, shout out to Eric Kahn and Hard Men's podcast. Uh, I just I, I heard your episode and I was like, okay, strength training. I mean, I could always learn more about that, and I've been doing it for a long time. But your perspective is really unique, and I, I like it a lot. So I wanted to bring you on and talk maybe first more about kind of your upbringing and sort of your your outlook on leadership, since we're a servant leadership faith based sure. podcast, and you're a you're a believer, strong man of faith, and yes, sir. literally. Um, and uh, so yeah, give us a little bit of background about your your faith journey, just some heroes growing up that you had, and and kind of what you looked at as a model leadership, how you learned about leadership. You know, it's dude, I have done a hundred. Well, I've probably done close to a thousand podcasts and I don't know that anybody has ever asked me who I looked up to as a kid in all the pod. That's in that weird. That seems like a kind of natural question you would ask. I guess. Yeah. Uh, which weird. means I probably haven't thought about it very much, but I, I will. Let's, let's get into it. So I, I was i uh, I'm a Southern Baptist preacher's kid. Uh, my dad uh, was saved a little later in life, uh, 25 years old. He was a civil engineer, very smart, high IQ, um, lost him in March this year from Lewy mm-hmm. body dementia, uh, miss him for sure every day. Um, but he, um, he had called in the ministry, uh, at, at 25 and, uh, went to seminary. And so one of my earliest memories is, is shipping off to seminary when I was five years old. And, um, and so I lived that sort of PK life in rural, mostly Arkansas, uh, very, very poor, very poor upbringing, wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, certainly looked up to my dad. You know, I, I just, my dad taught us um, important things, taught us about the gospel primarily. And I'm very thankful for that. Taught us how to, had a great relationship with my mom, how to love my mom well. How, so, you know, how to love your wife and how to, how to, uh, how to be a gospel centered dad and a father. And, and mm-hmm. so he certainly wasn't perfect, but I had a, a great relationship with him. And so, he taught me those things. So, you know, the first thing I think that you do, especially in the early to mid eighties, when you're, when you're a little kid and there's no internet and there's not, you know, in my world was sort of closed off. We lived in a really tough town uh, outside of Memphis, Tennessee on across the river in Arkansas where during the crack em- epidemic. And so my, my parents homeschooled us. I don't know if it was, they homeschooled us out of, you know, we homeschool our kids um, mm-hmm. because we want to give them the best education we can. And we think we can do better than public schools. And I think for mm-hmm. them, they were just trying not to get us killed. And we were like, it was, I mean, that sounds crazy, but it, it, it was true. just, that was the world. And so, yeah. um, you know, I, I looked up to dad a lot. Uh, my dad at the time, um, he had come from a relatively athletic background. He was kind of a big, a big guy, not, not, not a big overweight guy, but just like a big framed guy, you know, six one and probably I don't know, 225 or something. So mm-hmm. just a good side, you know, and you look up at your dad, like he's like the strongest guy in the world. Yep. And so I think I looked up to him that way. Um, and so, um, however, he, he didn't talk a lot about what it was like to be a leader or how to be a man or biblical manhood. He, I think he modeled it pretty well, but we just, those weren't lessons. And I think some of that stuff came naturally to him. And also that boomer generation just doesn't talk about stuff very much. Right. And so, right. um, you know, so I, over time, I think I, I, I saw myself as I was, I was really smart and kind of nerdy and, and semi-athletic. Uh, but I often tell people I was kind of just utterly forgettable in school. I was just like painfully average in all things. You know, I, was sm- <laughs> I was smart, but you know, you don't, you don't get popular because you're smart. And so, uh, you know, I was just, I was just, and I was sort of the, you know, if you've seen the old comic strip from the fifties, I was like the hundred pound weakling on, on the beach. I was just kind of uh, physically weak. I graduated high school at 155 pounds. So little guy, Mm. I was a basketball player, did not play football, did not wrestle, did not do those things. And, um, my senior high school, I discovered weightlifting, started lifting in a a lifting class and then actually, uh, was a, a really good student. So I actually then got to whatever it's called, be like a teacher's aide. So I actually had weightlifting like two hours a day, my senior year of high school, which is pretty cool. Cause one time nice. I was 80 and the other one I was attending and I just really got into lifting and I went to a couple lifting competitions for high school kids. This was in 97 and I did pretty well, like surprisingly well, like I didn't know how I didn't have anything to base it off of. Again, there's no internet. And yeah. I certainly hadn't discovered, you know, powerlifting USA magazine at the time or anything. So I just went there and I still, again, I was, maybe 155 pounds, 160 pounds. And I did very well, especially for my weight. And I thought, no, I'm pretty good at this. And then got out of high school and had uh, no sports to compete in because I wasn't good enough to play in college and 
started lifting and just enjoyed the lifting process. Um, watch my body change a lot. I hit puberty really late. I probably hit puberty like this summer between my sophomore and junior year of high school. So 16 years old, so almost 17 years old, it's pretty late mm. to hit it. And I went from like five, five to six, one. And so, wow. uh, so that's how I first got into strength training. Um, you know, and as I think about, I, you, you know, I was just really into sports. I don't know that I ever really looked up to, and this is probably even same today. I don't know that I've ever had somebody that was sort of a hero or somebody that I looked up to that was like, I really just want to be like them. And, you know, certainly I, I was a, you know, I was a huge, I was a St. Louis Cardinal fan. And so I watched Ozzie Smith growing up as a kid and I watched the, you know, Maguire, uh, in the, in that saga, 98, 99 and, and, uh, Michael Jordan and all those, but like, I, I knew I wasn't going to be them. And so I wasn't really striving to be that. I just think I enjoyed that, enjoyed sports and enjoyed, um, I, I would get the, Sports Illustrated, I would get the Almanac, Sports Almanac every yeah. year. My parents would throw away the swimsuit edition, as they probably should have, yeah. and not yeah. let me have it. And then they, and then I would have the Sports Almanac, and I would memorize the stats. And it's funny, because now as a CEO of a, of a large company, I'm, I'm still very stats-oriented. I, I'm not, I don't really watch sports at all anymore, very yeah. little. Um, just, just keep up on a very small level. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I, I wired for those, that stat line. And so That's I like cool. those things. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think... That And the other part of that is this, is that I have always had a unquenchable thirst for knowledge hmm. for whatever I'm interested in. And in the late 90s and early 2000s, that was strength training. That was powerlifting. That was lifting weights. And so I would go to the library at uh, University of Missouri where I was getting my undergrad, sorry, Missouri State University where I was getting my undergrad. And, um, you know, I would go down to the basement of the library and search what I call the catacombs down there of these old, like these Russian texts that have been translated into English about, you know, science and practice of strength training by Vladimir Zatsiorsky. And, wow. but you know, these books that are these, wow. nobody knows what they are, but for me, I felt like I had found the Holy grail of strength training. So I did a deep dive there. A lot of the coaches. And of course that was, that coincided with really the beginnings of the internet. Yeah. And so I developed good friends and good, you know, online friendships, which felt weird at the time, but they were, were what turned out to be some of the best strength coaches that ever lived. And so these guys were my mentors. So that's cool. Um, these guys who are, you know, Louis Simmons and Glenn Penley and Mark Ripito and guys like that became my mentor. And, and I, I developed a pretty close personal relationship with most of those guys. Yeah. And again, I don't know that I wanted to become them. I don't, because right. I just don't think I'm wired that way. I always kind of wanted to be who I am and, and just, but I did want to make my mark on that industry. And so, yeah. Um, did that in strength conditioning for, cool. for many years and eventually opened the, the online coaching. Yeah. Business. Well, and we talk about heroes and I think, you know, it's a big word and everybody sort of associates that with, well, these are the people that I wanted to be growing up. Well, you know, I think we, as we evolve, we start looking at traits of different people and then we sort of piecemeal, you know, that, quote unquote, perfect leader or perfect man or, or that ideal situation that we think we want to emulate. And, you know, it sounds like you did get that from your dad, even though he didn't sit down and pull out a PowerPoint of here's sure. what a man looks like. Here's what masculinity is. Um, <clears throat> I guess I want to kind of uncover your opinion um, about where we stand today in society and what masculinity is and should be, and then kind of get your take on what, what's going on with culture and how we're, they're sort of force feeding us this, this, I guess, false narrative, you know, that contradicts everything pretty much that the Bible has said about it. So talk to me if you, I don't know if you have a son, I think, do you have a daughter? Um, two daughters, yep. two daughters. So if you but had one, a son, one of whom has a very serious boyfriend, <laughs> she's yeah. 17, Christian 18, they've been together for three years. And so, okay. We've been going through this a lot lately in my what I would call premarital counseling that he doesn't really not understand that's what it is. Right. That's, sure. what that's you know the screening process. I get Yeah, it. that's right. Um, that's right. <clears throat> so if you had a son and you were, you know, kind of molding this person, like what do you want some some big things, some foundational masculinity principles to be a part sure. of their DNA? Like kind of give us your rundown on what that looks like. Well, I you know, I think this is laid out so well in, in scripture that mm -hmm. we are called to be be prophets, to be priests, to be kings, to protect and provide for our family. And so, you know, what that means to me is like, first off, it's, it's my job to lead my family spiritually well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the first and primary importance uh, of my calling as a husband and a father. 
as a leader in my own family that you think about spheres of sovereignty and and this idea that like my the first thing that I have to take care of before I get to my church or my community or my business or anything is my family. And so I have to lead them well and I have to lead them well spiritually well. And so it's my job to understand and to that that never ending pursuit of knowledge. At some point, I, I became very, very um, obsessed almost with theology and doctrine and Bible. And it wasn't just head knowledge stuff. I, I mean, I was I really love it. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's that's the first piece of this. And then and then again, it's it is anti uh, it's probably not politically correct to say, but I mean, I am I am the king of this little household. Right. And and in the same way that that Jesus is king and that that I'm called to love my wife as Christ has loved the church and yeah. to raise my children under the authority of Scripture and uh, in the same way. And then and so it's not about it's not about forcing my wife and my kids to be subservient to me. It's about serving them well. Like I've never felt like Jesus forced me to be subservient to him. I'm called to submit just like he was called to submit to the father. And so, um, you know, doing that well is really difficult. Loving my quiet, my wife is Christ is love the church. That's one of the hardest things, maybe the hardest thing that I'm Absolutely. called to do in life. It's incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. And so, so I'm, I'm called to be that first, uh, you know, I'm, I'm called to, I'm called to protect and provide. And so, I think that most men uh, struggle with either sinful, probably ambition, they become workaholics or sinful passivity and yeah. they're lazy and want to play video games and play on the internet too much. And mine, I, there was actually a time in my life where I was the sinful passive one. It's probably during my undergrad in college before I had kids and whatnot, but I'm certainly wired to be the other way and have been now for 15 or 20 years. And so you know, I have to know when to, especially as a CEO of a, of a large company, I have to know when to turn it off and to shut down and just be dad and husband. And so, uh, but I, I, I provide for my family. My family's never, my, my wife, <laughs> she asked the other day, she's like, you know, it's funny. I was thinking like, I have no idea how much money's in the bank account. And I was like, do you want to know? She's like, nope, I don't want to know because she trust. she knows when it's time to go get groceries or put gas in the car, it's there. That's my job. And so, you know, I, I think those these things are all super important, and then and then to be able to protect my protect my family, and mm -hmm. both from a cultural, spiritual, like understanding how to put the fence around your family when necessary, mm -hmm. and and protect, but also even on a practical level. And this is where strength training, I think, comes in. I think learning how to be harder to kill, learning how to I, your family needs to know, like dad, dad's going to be the first one. If somebody comes through the door, he's there to protect this family, and so. Um, you know, and there are lots of things I think that, that can, that can go there. Like certainly you could learn how to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and fight. Right. You can learn how to, how to, how to shoot guns, which I've, I've done a lot of tactical training as well. But I, I think for me, strength training is one of those things that falls under that, that protection piece where it is the, probably the number one way that I can diffuse drama around my life and around my family. People just don't mess with a guy when you're 275 and you can squat 600 pounds. It's just not that you don't get messed with. And yep. so, and you know, and oh, by the way, I'm not at a bar when it closes at 1 30 in the morning. Good point. So I don't put myself <laughs> in a situation where somebody can get drunk enough to try to, you know, decide like, I'm just going to go try to take out the biggest guy in the room. That's get not courageous. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And so I, all these things are really important. And then, you know, I was thinking about last night, I was talking about, I was listening to a, a Vody Bauckham um, sermon mm -hmm. about, you know, what he must be if he wants to marry my daughter. And he has a book about the it's so good, dude. It's so good. I got to get that. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's amazing. And he's got it. He's got a. I got the book. I got the audio book, and then he has a sermon that he preaches on it. That I sent both my my seventeen year old daughter and her and her boyfriend, who they've really been together for several years. And walking through that, and I started thinking about the fact that you know, right now I am, I am my wife and my daughters, all both my daughters, but specifically for the seventeen year old, I am her. I am her head. There's there's headship there. That's what that's what biblical patriarchy is. Again, that word that word is like a ugh, word. Right. And that's not about that's not about you know I I'm gonna extend the scepter and if you don't if I don't I'm gonna cut your head off. That's not this at all. Right. Right. But I am her biblical head and she has taken my name. Her last name is Reynolds because I am her head and there will be a day when she gets married that I will pass off that headship yeah. and I want them to understand like the gravity of that. They're gonna pass off your headship. And you at the end of this ceremony will no longer have my name. You'll have the last name of your husband mm -hmm. and he is the head. And so this is not like my family. And then their family is this like, 
you know, uh, step down from it. It's a, it's a whole nother family. And this is like, there's a lot of gravity there. And so yeah. I think spending time as a, as a man to lead your family. Well, uh, we have, and listen, I, of course, I certainly have not at all been a perfect husband or perfect father. I've made all sorts of mistakes. Um, but over the past decade or so, I've spent a lot of time really trying to pour wisdom into my family. We have very, um, intentional, conversations at dinner every single night about any myriad of topics. And so, Mm -hmm. so that my kids understand not just the, what we believe, but the, why we believe it and how that, how that filters down to the, how and how it's practiced in the trenches so that they don't just adopt the way mom and dad think, but we've taught them how to think for themselves. And so all of these things encompass, I think, biblical masculinity. Yeah. Um, and, and the thing that I see in the church, and I, you can probably lead me there here, is that I, I think that you're seeing two things. You're, you're seeing, obviously, there is an enormous rise in this from, from mainstream media and from just the m- middle of the bell curve, this uh, fight against toxic masculinity. Yeah, right. And I, obviously, I imagine that the bulk of your listeners are not on board with such things. But one of the things that I am seeing from the Christian community, from the even the very well uh, grounded theological Christian community, is that they believe in this idea of biblical masculinity and biblical patriarchy or headship and how to do this well. And they're doing some of it well, but on the physical side, you know, I go to these Christian conferences, there's a lot of dudes walking around at 400 pounds. You're right. And they they believe what I'm saying. They're like, yeah, I know I need to, I know I need to get in shape. I know I need like no, you don't understand. Like you're gonna die and leave right. your family and not be able to protect, provide, be a priest or king because you're not gonna be here. And so I think that I don't think that strength training is the be all end all for this stuff. As a matter of fact, I think it's the the fourth in importance for this thing. It's not one, two, or three, but we are called to steward our our bodies well. Yeah, we are called to as part of this process of protecting and providing and leading well our families we're called to to take care of our bodies and try to prolong it as much as we can so that we can continue to do that like i i, I want to walk my daughters down the aisle i want to watch my granddaughters get walked down the aisle i want to see mm-hmm. high school graduations and and you know all in the births of my my grandkids like these things mm-hmm. are important and and there's these again i think that probably all of your listeners are like yeah 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 me too i want that too and then but then they're they're eating crap and they're not doing anything and they're and they're going to work in the cubicle and they're spending their days on Zoom calls and they're not you know again we don't live in a society where most of us are doing blue collar hard labor with our hands. Mm-hmm. If you're in construction, you're framing houses, you're a mechanic, you're working on cars, you're a farmer, you you might not need this. I still think you do, but I think that it would be second. But for most of us, that's not most of it. Even me, as I'm a CEO of an online right. business. Everything I do is at the computer. So I right. have to go in the gym and I have to do the things that that I'm I probably would have done things that look like that 50 or 60 years ago had I worked on the farm and been on a homestead and raised my but I don't. Yeah. And so I have yeah. to do those things. I mean, we live in a sedentary world for the most part now, I believe, unless you're intentional and you have to seek it out. Like you, you have to go find, and I think you even mentioned voluntary. Uh, hardship. What do you call hardship? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you even, ha- you have to literally sign up for this kind of thing because it's not going to come find you in your everyday life, most likely. Um, and I, I'm glad you mentioned your daughter and passing the name and, and kind of this, this kingship headship, uh, you know, I, cause I wanted to ask you about rites of passage and, and, you know, with daughters, I don't guess as dads, we necessarily think of that. We think of it more along the lines of my three sons, what am I going to pass them? You know, more than just a watch or a, a knife, right. That's a hundred years right. old. I want to, I want to, you know what I mean? So do you have any ideas for daughters and rites of passage? Oh my God. You're of course you're going to ask me about daughters. Uh, I have a list for boys and I don't even have boys. It's probably 75 things long. <laughs> because I think about it so much. Um, so the answer is yes, we have this for daughters as well. It's it's again, it's my job to pass down much of this spiritual leadership to my daughters. But I do think that much of the most of the hard skills and soft skills that your daughters should learn should come from mom. And so, yeah, yeah. you're you, you know, uh, um, my my wife is a stay at home mom. She was a kindergarten teacher for for 13 years. Um, and again, I, we've, we've homeschooled our kids for pretty much their entire life. My oldest one was in public school for a few years. And so, you know, you don't become a public school teacher being pro homeschool. Mm-hmm. And, um, 
And so she is, we've been blessed that my wife can be a stay at home mom and can help raise our kids. And they're matter of fact, they're it's eight in the morning right now. And they're upstairs doing homeschool. And, um, so, so learn, you know, teaching your daughters one, how to pursue knowledge, I think is just as important. Again, it comes back to that thing. Like we don't want our daughters to be stupid because they're sure. not leading a family spiritually. It's really important that they understand yeah. the gospel. They understand doctrine. They understand how to pursue knowledge. Uh, but of course there are these, there are these skills that they need. There is a time for, for your daughters that they often will have to provide for themselves. They may have to provide for themselves right. for a short period of time. There's a time when they may be married and young and broke when they have to right. work. Uh, before they have children. And so, so understanding uh, what work ethic looks like, you know, both my daughters, nanny, um, they both work for me. They, they work for me. So I, my oldest daughter, nanny's full days on Tuesdays and Thursdays, she works for us on Monday, Wednesday, Friday for, for pay. Like it's not chores. I'm not paying my kids to do their homework and keep their room clean. Like that's, right. that's expected. Yeah. Like I do those things. It's that the business and the household has these additional things and your daughter, your kids get old enough, your daughter's and sons get old enough. They need money. They want money. They want to put gas in the car. We don't pay for that either. Um, and so they yeah. can work for those things. And so we teach them work ethic. We model work ethic. We teach them how to cook and clean and manage the household. We model that well. We Our, our home is clean. Uh, it's picked up. We model bedtimes and wake up times yeah. and schedules. And, and so, of course, there's all of those things. And I think there are a lot of those things that um, a lot of the hard skills for boys that I've laid out. And I, I have that because we have so many men in our church that have sons and we've, we've talked through this, you know, how to, you know, how to yeah. look at it, like how to strength train, how to throw a ball, how to, how to sprint, how to jump, how to hunt, how to field dress game, how to fish, how to sharpen a knife, how to build a shelter. I mean, that's the first 10 and I've got yeah. another 60 on the list. Well, and tell some me, of those can I, get, yeah, yeah can ahead. I ask you a question real quick? So yeah. I guess basic bare bones of this, I don't, do we have as men, do we have, um, a proper definition or context of what rites of passage really is like talk about like what in your opinion is it something that's just passed down is it a is it a part of your dna that you want to pass down to that generation sure. of lifestyle work ethic those kinds of intangible sure. soft skills like you mentioned like or is it rites of passage of here is your first bible and here is sure. uh you know why you need this and and obviously those are basic but Give us an idea, or do we miss it on what rites of passage? Really I think means? we do miss it. I think one. I think one. I think at a bare minimum, you should be considerate and intentional about what you teach your kids. Mm -hmm. But two, I think there's actually times where. So again, without getting too detailed and to not embarrass my kids, you know, I had the sex talk with my daughters first. Mm, really? Yeah, because I think it was important for them to understand they could come to me about you know you know we're very careful and and I I spent hours talking through these things to mom. And so I took my daughters out and had these talks about like, this is what this is. This is what sex. And we didn't lie to them about it. You know, we were yeah. like, it wasn't the, it's going to feel awful. And it's going to be terrible. And you're going to end up with syphilis and all that, you know, all those things can be possible, but we were honest and we we're like, no, this is literally created by God and it's beautiful and wonderful, but this will hurt your soul if yeah. it's not done inside the context of marriage. It cannot. Right. And so we walk through and we walk through, you know, the spiritual implications and the heart implications and the physical implications and all those right. things. And my wife has an incredible relationship with my kids. And so they're going to go to her with a lot of these detailed things and great. Right. Of I don't course. need to deal with like what's going on in the month. Let's and not. so <laughs> so not interested, <laughs> but, but to talk about some of those, I, I think that again, my generation is gen X parented by boomers Same. our parents just didn't talk about this stuff and i didn't want my kids to if if something happened for good or bad or indifferent but it was a a, a thing i need my daughters to be comfortable enough to come to me and be like dad i ain't got to talk to you about a thing and so we talked about those things now from back to the rites of passage there was a podcast that a good friend of mine art the art of manliness by brett mckay is a, mm -hmm. it's a huge podcast mm -hmm. and uh, he's one of my clients and close friends and i've been on his podcast several times um, he had a guy on a, a few months ago that talked about this very topic of rites of passage specifically for men and for boys. Okay. And they, they had, um, they take their sons. First off, they put them in a community, you know, they're in a community of other, of other boys that are about the same age, 12, let's say 12, 13 years old, or, you know, of course they're, they just grow up together and the dads have different skills. So like, I'm not great at working on cars. 
Same. Yeah. But it would be the kind of thing that if I had a son, I would want him to know the. I would. He needs to know how to change the oil. He needs to know how to change a tire. I taught my daughters how to change a tire, right? Like those. Yeah. Because life skills. That's right. Those sort of things. But they actually have a a ceremony when the boys are like thirteen years old, where they have sort of a dinner with mom that is a oh there's a word for it but it's sort of a hey you're not mom's little boy anymore mom will still always be here for you but this is sort of the like when you skin your knee mom's not going to come kiss your boo-boo you're 13 years old yes it's time to be a man and so then they go out they do like camping for a couple days with the dads and all the boys Mm -hmm. and there's this right there's this passage of like you you are expected to learn the skills to become a man now and it's it's and while mom will always love you and love you unconditionally and will be there for you and give you a hug, she's not there to pick you up when you scrape your knee like that, that those days are now over. Yeah. And I think that's very valuable to have those. I think those times those it, it, listen, it's it's why why do we have a marriage ceremony? What's important? We I had this talk actually last night at dinner with my family. Well, listen, if you think I'm spending twenty five thousand dollars on a wedding, you're crazy. Right. But. I don't want you to just go to Hawaii and get married and make it a marriage honeymoon because I think the understanding the weight of the covenant relationship yep. you're entering into is really important. Profession I, uh, publicly, yes. That's right, in front of all your community. Like this is I'm committing to this. Yeah. Like for better and for worse and there will be worse. There yep. will be worse. Yep. And I think it's the same thing as a rite of passage for boys. It's like, look, you're you there is there there are these times that you're going to go through that I think we should we should spend more time in the Western world focused on those, those time periods. And again, I don't think it's a, there's a hard line time, but that, you know, 13 year old, 12, 13 years old, they are no longer a child. Right. And I think you probably get another one at, at 17 or 18 that they mm-hmm. are a man. And mm-hmm. there is a, almost should be a graduation of that. And then say like, your learning's not over. Your learning will continue. But I, I think putting some gravity uh, in those rites of passage, I think are really important. It's really good. Yeah. And I like it as you're talking, I'm starting to think of just creating the dynamic in your family of open communication. And this is how we operate. We talk about stuff out in the open. Like that to me is a rite of passage. Like you're laying the groundwork to say, look, your family should carry this torch as well of, because our parents, like you said, I didn't have the sex talk. I didn't have a lot of talks. I mean, but my dad was always around. Like he was a great model of masculinity and leadership, but we just didn't really talk about stuff. It just didn't happen. And so sure. us creating that open environment and a platform for people to feel safe and talk, I think is huge in a family. And hopefully that gets carried on, you know, beyond us. Um, but by I the love way, just the last, let me yeah. put a cherry on that one for us. Yeah. That also comes down to, we are very, our family is probably transparent to a fault that we try to, we have created a culture in our household that has carried over into our church uh, with occasionally a little rub against it yeah, of sure. we confess sin and we operate under the power of the gospel, which means when c- people confess sin and repent from sin, we forgive sin and we walk through that and move on. We don't yeah. carry grudges. We don't hold like these are important. And so we don't build animosity for others. Uh, our our yeah. church takes communion every single Sunday, which I think is super important without yeah. diving down that rabbit trail right. because it's we deal with sin on a weekly basis. In our home, we deal with it on a daily basis. And so we have these conversations. And so my daughters don't know anything different. As a matter of fact, again, my daughter's uh, my daughter's boyfriend, his family, great Christian family, but doesn't have that same culture. And so the concept of just like laying it out there, here I am, here's my sin, here's my faults. Well, that's scriptural. So foreign. Yeah. It's foreign foreign to them you know yeah it's, yeah it's scriptural and i think that's the most important thing is when kids see us really actually living out what we're talking about in the bible on sunday you know and and we're applying these scriptures because they are living and breathing and you know they're not just words on a page that we try to memorize and and then recall at at church only um so no i think that's great because it's yeah. it's putting legs on on the the bible and the scriptures um I love, I mean, where this was going and, and I, I, you know, my boys, I guess let's give a, give advice to a guy and I want to get into some of the like nuts and bolts of your strength training and program sure. and different things. But before we leave this topic, give some advice to a dad with boys who maybe is beyond that 
18 years, like early twenties. And maybe he missed the boat on 13 and the conversation and the 17 year old, you know, you need to be a more of a producer than a consumer. Now you're 18 and that kind of, so let's talk to the dad that maybe feels like he missed the boat on some of that. Well, I mean, you just, you got to play catch up. It doesn't stop. It doesn't, it doesn't relieve you of your duties. Right. And so, you know, if I had a kid that was 18 years old, if I, I mean, listen, my, well, I, I've had times in my life, we haven't always done this well. We've done it pretty well for the past decade. And so luckily my oldest was, she was seven, but I wish I had done it, started this when she was born. And I was just a mess for the first seven years of her life. And so likewise, if you have a kid who's already an adult, I mean, if, you, if you're if you listening to this and, you, and your son's 30 right. and you miss the boat, you need to start having intentional lunches with your kid. You need to start, you know, like go get coffee with That's your good. kid. Yeah. By the way, you Another rite of passage. You should teach your kids how to drink coffee. Uh, anyway, 100%. so <laughs> it's the, um, yeah, whenever I mean an adult that doesn't drink coffee, it raises a red flag. I'm like, what? Or if they drink, drink decaf, coffee? even. I'm sorry no. if I, oh, offend I don't people. believe in that. I'd no, rather somebody not drink coffee than drink decaf. Thank but anyway, you. <laughs> sorry. You're invited I, uh, back for sure. No, you, you just, I mean, look, I think it's, it's about being intentional to go, what are the lessons I'd like to pass down to my kids? And, and I don't think that stops at 18, regardless, even if you do it well, it doesn't stop at 18. Correct. Right. We're going to do, well, I hope we're going to do this well, but like, how much can we teach our daughters about actually having children, about literally the process of being pregnant, having children, mm. breastfeeding, not sleeping at night so, until they have kids. Mm. So there's going to be a day when they're going to have kids and they're going to be, who knows, 21, 25, however old they are. And they're having kids and mom is going to sit down with them and go like, let me let me walk through this with you, right? That's a lesson that we can talk about it now a little bit, but it's not really a yep. lesson that you can really understand until you're going through the thing or, or you know, what it's like to then raise kids. And so those lessons never stop. So if you never started those lessons, you can start them right now. It's never too late to start those lessons. I would start making the list of, and th- this is what I do. I, I am, I am a uh, voracious uh, list maker. And I just use the notepad on my phone. I'm titling it. I always title it something that's very clear what I'm making a list on. And I'm just going about my day. And maybe I'm listening to podcasts or sermons or books or walking, just whatever I'm working. And something pops into my head. I just jot it down really quick so I can come back to it so that when we have those conversations, those intentional conversations, I do the same thing with my wife. I mean, I guess the, the, a, an easy transition here is, do you ever stop leading or, or teaching your wife? The answer is no. Like, I've been married almost 23 years. My wife and I have an incredible relationship. And by the way, I learn a ton from her just right. because there's this head shifting doesn't mean I can't learn from my wife. Of course I can learn from my wife. Uh, but I'm, I'm constantly trying to model and teach and think and have these intentional conversations. I think that's really what it comes down to is, are you having intentional conversations about the things that matter? And how sad to think that, that people, you know, men who often live very interesting lives pass down none of it to their kids, their family, their grandkids, because they just never think about either a, they're too scared to be vulnerable and transparent or B they just never think or care enough to actually have an intentional conversation. Yeah. And so these families, they get together on the holidays and they watch football games for nine hours rather than having conversation. And by the way, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't mind football games playing sure. in the background while I'm hammering Turkey on Thanksgiving. But Absolutely. if you never have the conversations, then you die having never passed anything down. And that's, that's what we're called to do. And so, you know, as a business owner, I I don't believe that the the business I own is going to be a legacy business that will last 50 years. I think the day will come when I'll sell the business. And, and so the legacy is in my family, in my church community and the community I've built, like that's that I want to last for many generations past me Mm -hmm. and that my grandkids are, are, um, taught on some level because of the things that I learned about the gospel, about doctrine, about theology, about culture, about family, those things get passed to my kids. Those kids, my kids pass them down to theirs and so on and so forth. Yeah. And I think the guy that you mentioned that might have led a pretty significant, impactful life, interesting life that doesn't pass anything. It's kind of back to that where we didn't ever really hear I love you for the, for that crowd. But yeah. the dad is like, they know I love them. Like I, I show it, you know? So the yeah. guy that doesn't teach just assumes people are watching and getting yeah. it by osmosis. And they're like, Oh, he goes to work every day. So he must be a hard worker. You know, right. we, we don't really stop and teach, Hey, this is what I did in this situation. This is why, like yeah. this could have gotten way out of hand, but I, did this and and we managed it and made it work out, you know, different little life scenarios like that. I don't think we stop enough 
for sure. and understand that that's a moment that we can teach. And I do that almost to a fault. Like you said earlier, I think I could, I mean, I may micromanage that sort of thing sometimes, but I feel like if it's a significant thing to me, I want them to maybe hear me process that and they understand the why behind some of it. Yeah, so I think absolutely. it's the dad that's just going so fast that he thinks they're just getting it by watching him. And that's, and right. that's not always the case, but that's all right. right, we're digging in. I have, I've strength trained for, I don't know, 20, 25 years. Um, I'm 50, just turned 50 this year. Um, been doing it in the garage since COVID never really stopped doing it in the garage. Cause sure. I just kind of like it. Um, and so let me give you a couple of, I'm going to do a truth or myth exercise okay. with you. Don't, I've sure. never done this, so it could just go totally derailed here, but I'm going to give you a statement. You tell me if it's a myth or a truth about okay. fitness and then okay. kind of unpack your answer a little, if you don't mind. Sure. All right. Cardio is overrated. Truth or myth. Oh, <laughs> the first one's hard. <laughs> no, um, in general, I would say yes. Truth. If your listeners are over 40 in general, I would say it's a myth. They need cardio. And they cardio is definitely overrated for fat loss, is definitely overrated for aesthetics, but is not overrated for cardiovascular health and fitness and longevity and reducing all-cause mortality. All of those things are important, yeah. and guys should be doing it, especially That's if you're good. over 40. Okay, good, good. And I, I do think to we could – I mean, obviously, there's context to some of these, and you could maybe get – maybe granular on sure. some of that, you know, because people are going, Oh, well, he said, don't do cardio. That's not what he's saying. So no, actually, uh, I think almost everybody should, but yeah, just don't I, do it to lose weight. If, I need you're to trying, if you need to lose it. fat, you need to stop putting crap in your mouth. You, you don't need Correct. to, you know, it's not the car. You can't out exercise a bad diet. That's what it comes down to. That's great. Right? You can't out exercise or out cardio, you know, chain smoking and drinking five, alcoholic drinks a day that's great you can't yeah, out exercise no, that right so real yes. good i think you also said in a podcast and i don't know if it was on eric's show or not but something about really if you could just incorporate 15 minutes a couple times like after yep. or before i can't remember what you said yeah i like it after yep. so, after. yeah after yeah yeah i like to strength train and then do what i call high intensity interval training so hard right. as you can go for let's right. say 15 seconds a rest for 45 to 60 seconds and you're like on what it doesn't really matter for older guys i try to do low impact low skill stuff so okay i don't really want them sprinting down the street because they're right. 50 years old and they're going to bust up their knees and sure but you know something like a something like a airdyne bike or an echo bike or a c2 rower or pushing a prowler or something like that that okay. just doesn't have much impact and they just go as hard as they i mean hard as hard as you can go like if i'm on a rower this sounds really morbid and messed up but this will give you a side into my brain if I'm on a row machine, if you've ever done a row machine, I'm yeah. imagining my kids are drowning in the middle of a lake. There you go. And I got to get to them before they go under. Well, I mean, you and save I'm them, of course, it. every time you save them. Every so time. It's not right, but It's yeah, amazing. Yeah. I've used this with females. It's a terrible. And they just <laughs> nonchalantly. I'm like, no, your kids are drowning. And they're just like, shh, shh, shh. I'm like, I don't think you understand. Your kid is drowning. In, right. And so. Yeah. Actually, it's it's much easier for a guy. This is just a, a biological difference. It's much easier for a guy to go 100% on cardio than it is for women to go 100%. And so you almost have to manufacture that for women. So like loading up a big heavy prowler sled to push. Yeah. Imagine if you took your wife out and you made her push the truck down the road. Like you got to That's that takes some work. And there's no yeah. way to just do it like half. But, no. you know. And so uh, you got to, so you almost have to do that a lot of times with females, but now that yeah. the key for good cardio is just, you know, 10, 12, 15 minutes max of going as hard as you can for 15, 20, maybe 30 okay. seconds and resting between 60 and 90 seconds. And then doing that over and over again for anywhere from four to up to 10 rounds. If you can go 10 times real hard, rest a minute, real hard, rest a minute again, real hard, 15 seconds, maybe rest a minute. You can do that 10 times. I mean, that's basically 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, you are in impeccable cardiovascular shape okay good so. good I'll, I'll have to make a note of that uh all right so the next truth or myth on this one overtraining is real um it's it's pretty rare it's basically impossible for people under 25 to do it again for 40 year olds and older you certainly can train too much where there's too much fatigue built up and you can't recover some of this comes down to hormonal milieu, your recovery ability, what you're doing in your day job. Again, if you got a, if you're training really hard and you've got a very hard, active, uh, physical, physical labor sort of job, 
it's pretty easy to overtrain. If you have low testosterone, it's pretty easy to overtrain. Um, but the traditional concept of where it actually like affects your central nervous system, which is what that really comes from in the original text, is pretty rare. I mean, the amount of work you would have to do is where that first came from is like from Olympic level athletes. Okay. Not just Olympic weightlifters, but wrestlers and shot putters, throwers, things like that, who can the amount of I mean, they're full time professional athletes. They live yeah. at the Olympic Training Center. They train in the weight room twice a day. They practice their sport once or twice a day. Like that's their whole life. And yeah, yeah. you can take people to the edge at that point. But who who of us are doing that? Like I, yeah, I want minimum effective dose training anyway. I want to train the least I can for the greatest bang for my buck, the greatest benefit. And for but, most so, of our guys. I was yeah. going to say they could they could train about three times a week for an hour, three hours a week, and that's perfect. And they won't overtrain doing that. What about the guy that works shoulders three times a week? I mean, is well, that an overtraining? That's overtraining, is well, it? Well, it's the, yes, uh, it's not systemic overtraining, so it's not it doesn't yep. necessarily overtrain your central nervous system. Okay, but certainly your shoulders aren't going to grow. And it, right, more often than not, it's bench press and curls that guys are trying to do too much. So it's like, yeah, you can't. Here, easy way to know this is this if if you go to the gym and you can add weight to the bar every single time you're not overtraining if you've been stuck at like i've got a cousin who's a good friend of mine he's basically my age he bench presses like 225 for 10 every time he goes to the gym well i'm like you're not getting any better it's 225 for 10 so i just can't get 11 like maybe we should change the program man i mean you know it's yeah like, that's good so if you go in and do the thing and like yeah the shoulders hurt or you're, you're not able to add weight or add reps then you're not, you know, there, there's a process there that's called the stress recovery adaptation process. Mm -hmm. It's very, it was originally detailed by a guy named Hans Selye from Germany in the thirties. And, uh, I guess there was one good thing coming out of Germany in the thirties. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah true. And so, uh, but he, you know, it, there was this, it was this, you stress the body, uh, if you have an adequate amount of stress and then allow the body to recover, it will adapt to that stress. And so that it's ready for that stress next time. What do you do next time? Do you just, do the same stress. No, you do a little more stress mm. to force it to adapt to the next one up. And that's what progressive overload is. And so you, you just have to do a little more each time. How often should you rest between times? Well, like you certainly should rest, you know, 72 hours between sure. working muscle groups. Yeah. As a beginner, you can rest, you know, 72 hour, 48, 72 hours, and you can still make progress for a long time as an intermediate or advanced lifter. If you've been doing this for years, you often can only train a body part once a week or maybe twice a week, depending right. on your recovery ability. Got it. That's it. That's that's exactly right. Okay, that's that lines up with what I'm doing the the once a week and just really hard that one day. Yep. Um. So what about getting stronger? So the only way to get stronger is to lift heavy, low reps. Is that a truth or a myth? That's a truth. Yeah. Um. St strength literally is defined as force production, the ability to produce force. The only way we produce more force is to add more mass to put force against to push. Okay. Against. And so the only way to get strong, so you can't, you can't do, say, if you go from 30 push ups to 50 push ups, you didn't necessarily get stronger. You might have certainly if you go from 10 push ups to 30 push ups, you probably got stronger. Uh -huh. If you went from 50 push ups to 75 push ups, you just, that's just muscular endurance. Okay. And so you didn't necessarily get stronger. So, what we do with our program is we, ha we have guys do focus on every, not just guys, females, everybody. They do the four big lifts, the squat, the deadlift, the bench press, the press. That makes up 90% of what they do, 90%. And they do it typically for like three sets of five reps with the same weight, and they add five pounds every session. And so they might come in on Monday and do like squat for three sets of five, say 100 pounds, press for three sets of five at 75 pounds, so start, start light, right? deadlift for a lot of times one set of five or up to three sets of five for let's say 150 pounds and they're going to come in a couple days later and they're going to go up five pounds that's it okay and you're going to do that as long as you can everybody's like it can't be that simple no it's actually that simple because if you can add five pounds to the bar and the only exercises we do with beginners are those four main lifts and chin-ups or pull-ups chin-ups are just right, underhanded right. pull-ups are overhand that works the entire, every muscle group in the entire body gets right. worked. And so as a beginner, if you're like, how do I start this process? That's all you do. You don't have to go and do machines. You don't have to go and do cardio. You don't have to do any isolation movements, none of that stuff. Just get your squat up to like 250 pounds and your deadlift up to 350 pounds. 
and your bench press to 225 and your overhead press to 135 or 150, you can do that adding five pounds every, every workout three times a week and you'll get there and then, and then shoot me an email and then we'll figure it out. Right. Cause so, then, yeah, I was going to say, does it mirror the strong lifts program a little very bit? Very similar. Strong lifts does five sets of five. We found okay. that especially for older lifters, that's a little bit too much, a little bit too much volume for them. Three sets of five seems to be a little bit better. Um, I would even argue for most beginner, like even younger lifters, uh, 25 and, and under, I'd probably still have them do three sets of five. We, we coach first off strong lifts is a, what I would call a sister organization. They're very, we love them. They're great. They're better than 99% of the stuff out there. They've got a great app. It's fine. Um, they do, a, they do a good job of that stuff. We've just found that we can keep people making progress longer. If they do three sets of five, they hit the wall a little faster at five sets of five. That's what I was getting ready to ask you. Okay. Okay, anything I missed? I'm 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 out of truth or myth. Anything I missed that's like a myth that you wish oh, people I, would kind of wrap their brain stuff. around. There's I mean, probably a thousand um, things, but you know, what, what's guys a big are like, one? I can't lift because I got bad knees or a bad back. Yes, you can. Everybody listen to this has a bad knee or bad knees or a bad back or bad something. And you don't get better by not doing anything. You get better by making the muscles around the messed up joints. Like, listen, we're guys, we're old and there's sin from Genesis three. And so our bodies break down over time. Yeah. Yeah. And the way we, and so the joints are not going to get better. Uh, there's no way to, you know, they're just going to slowly get worse. And we all know people who have terrible arthritis have never lifted or done anything healthy in their whole life. And so what we want to do is build the muscle up around the joints to protect the joints and, and improve force production. That makes things a lot better. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't accidentally get bulky, even if, I mean, if you're a female or a guy, like, you know, women say this all the time. I don't want to lift because I don't want to get bulky. Like you're going to yeah. wake up one day and be a 230 pound linebacker. That's yep. not. Women don't have the hormonal milieu. They don't have testosterone, so they can't. It's almost impossible for women to build muscle. They can, but it's very hard. It's you got to, I mean, it's got to be very intentional. You don't like just lift weights and accidentally start putting on muscle. Guys don't do it either. I mean, you've got to eat a ton of protein. Yeah. Um, weightlifting doesn't stunt kids' growth. Your kids can lift. I would argue, I think it would be up. You, you would be making a mistake as a dad if you make your kids train. Those two things are different. So having fun, exercising, modeling it well, teaching them the form, teaching them how to lift, great. Teach them perfect form on squat and perfect form on deadlift. They're prepubescent. They can't hurt themselves. They can't lift heavy enough. Right, right. And the force that that acts on their body, is on their ankles, their knees, their hips, their femur, their shins, their back, when they play soccer, is three to five X as much as they could ever get squatting as heavy as they could possibly go there. Oh, and nobody ever says, yeah. don't let your kids play soccer. That's right. Soccer stunts your growth. You've never heard that because it that's doesn't, right? right? So it's that's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so yeah, man, there's a ton of stuff there's like that. Uh, muscle cannot turn to fat when you get all oh, like, you know, here I'm 275 pounds, one. like yeah. all your muscles. Well, I want my muscle to turn to diamonds or gold or something that's valuable. Like that's ridiculous. Think about how ridiculous. Like, really, everybody, you really know this. Think about it. How would muscle made of protein turn to fat? not made of protein. I think what people mean is it just looks like it turned to fat because now you see more of my fat than my muscle because I stopped building muscle. That's exactly <laughs> right. And I kept eating like I was training. Yes. So this yes. is what happens. You get a, you see this like, you know, often some linemen in an NFL who are not necessarily lean in the first place, but they, they try to get their body weight to 330 pounds and they're big jacked 330 pound dudes. Yeah, a little bit fat too. Right. And then they get out of the NFL and they keep eating like they're playing in the NFL and training only they stop training. And so, yeah, their muscle atrophies, it gets yep. smaller and their fat grows. <laughs> they had fat. So you're just losing one and adding another, but it doesn't change yep. to a thing. You also yep. can't turn fat to muscle. You can't, you know, like if people get leaner over time and add some muscle, they added muscle and yep. they reduce the size of their fat. Nothing converts. There's no magical conversion. Yeah. How much protein per day should a person consume if say they weigh 185 pounds and they're trying to get trying to get jacked let's just say and well, i know that's it's, a, so such a it's the easy term. the easy one is you should eat about one gram of protein per pound of your body weight okay that's what so I right. 185 you should have 185 grams of protein and that actually doesn't matter if you're trying to gain weight or lose weight so okay. if you need to gain muscle or if you need to lose fat the protein intake should always stay high so if you're like man i weigh 275 like i'm a big like not me 275 but let's say it's a guy listening he's like i'm 275 and i'm kind of sloppy fat still eat two, 275 grams of protein Really? All the changes is the amount of carbohydrates and fat you eat. So if you're trying to gain weight, you need to make sure that you're eating about 500 calories over your maintenance. 
get your get your base protein in one gram per pound of body weight okay. and a gram of proteins four calories yeah and then you're going to add the rest with carbs and fat and i don't really care lots of people get lots of arguments about this right high carb low fat high fat keto low carb sure, sure. like it doesn't matter it doesn't matter it's mostly calories in calories out as long as you get your protein you're fine if you're trying to lose weight though it's the same thing you just eat about 500 calories under maintenance but the thing you cut out is the carbs and the fat, not the protein. So you still get your protein. So protein is high no matter what. Yeah. And then you just cycle your carbs and fat. And a lot of times that's based on how you feel. I, I am actually a very, I like people eating, relative, especially if they're training hard, higher carb, lower fat. I think now I think it needs to be single ingredient, non-processed carbs, right? Yeah. So, so vegetables and single like rice and potatoes and like a yeah. single ingredient, right? Not processed stuff. I feel a little better personally eating a little higher fat and a little lower carb. I just feel better. Okay. I, I can't explain it. It just, I feel like carbohydrates make me hot, make my face red a little bit more. I certainly okay. eat plenty of carbs around training, but then I try to limit them for the rest of the day. Yeah. Uh, it just doesn't matter that much. Okay. Keep the protein high and, and then cycle. Well, and, and I know I, I may have lied to you when I said certain amount of time for this. So I wanted, I got two more questions and no, then you're I'll fine. cut you I'm loose. Good, you're, you're a CEO for crying out loud. I mean, have no, some fine, respect man. for my time, dude. <laughs> yeah. Um, so give me, uh, it's kind of a two folds, kind of a one and a one a, but all right. What, tell us what sets your program apart. Barbell logic, um, because I mean, we've all worked out with dumbbells. I don't know if you meant sure. to have a play on words with dumb sure. and logic and all that, but well done if you did, uh, barbell logic, what makes you guys unique and what, you know, what sets you apart? And then sure. also kind of what's your yardstick for success for the people you train? Oh, that's great. Great questions. Uh, thanks for letting me talk about that, by the way. Uh, yeah. barbell logic is a company that focuses on strength training prim primarily. And we didn't get into this, but very quickly strength. If you think about all of the physical attributes you can have strength being one of those, right? Strength, speed, power, agility, mobility, all those things. Strength is the only one that makes all the other ones better. Mm. Not forever, but if you take an untrained, if you listen to this right now and you mostly go home and watch Netflix at night, if you just start strength training, your mobility will get better because you're squatting full range of motion. Your agility gets better. Power is a function. Almost everything is a function of strength if you go back to your algebra equations. Mm -hmm. And so we focus on strength, but we focus on strength primarily as a way to improve quality of life, not to get abs and take pictures of ourselves and post them on Instagram. Yeah. So hopefully that resonates with your listeners because I assume that your listeners are not dudes who are just trying. So, so there aren't a lot of people, one, focused on strength. They're either focused on aesthetics or cardio or something else. Um, there aren't a lot of people that gear specifically towards the middle-aged man, which is pretty mm -hmm. much, and we're about 30% female and I've got a bunch of female coaches that coach our females as well. Yeah. And we do that as well. And then we focus on this idea of voluntary hardship, minimum effective dose changes, longevity, sustainability. Our clients stay for about 40 months on average, which is insane because we don't have contracts at Barbara Logic. So that's, that's important. So the other thing then about the specifics in the trenches of our program that I think is really different is I hate personal training and I'm trying to put personal training. I'm trying to kill that industry because personal training is one, it really expensive. It costs 400, 500, $600 a month and more. If you live in a big city, uh, you've got to connect with your trainer's schedule. Your trainer's like, I'm only open from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays or whatever. Uh, so that's difficult. There's no flexibility. Uh, your trainer is often, I'm sorry, a moron some 18 year old kid with a purple polo with a name tag that says trainer, not who I want. And so what we did at Barbara logic, we're an online coaching company where you sign up for if your first month is always hundred percent free. There's no, there's like, what's the catch? There's no catch. It's not first month free. And then a six month contract, no contracts. Like you get to just try it out free. We pair you with a perfect coach for you. You take kind of a survey about your goals and who, what you're looking for and things like that. We pair, we've got 60 coaches that work for us the best strength coaches in the world, all over the world. Uh, they program for you after doing an intro Zoom call with you. You film your lifts and upload them to our app. We all have our, we have our own software. And then your coach fully breaks down your lifts via a screen recording within 24 hours. And it costs you about 25% of what personal training costs. And the coach makes about 4X dollars per hour because it takes less, because it's on online coaching, you don't, you think about if you go and you spend an hour with a personal trainer, 45 minutes of that is rest periods. You're, you're just not, you're not really doing anything. And so in online coaching, it's, you know, you're actually lifting like five minutes a day. So 
those are all the things that sort of separate us, I think, in the... In so the, so in did the you guys world. sort of... Is that a proprietary concept that you created with the app and the online and the virtual and this and just more efficiency? We're, we're, it's, we, I think we were the first. We're one of the only ones. We're certainly one of the biggest uh, online right now. Yeah. There are, you know, we have some competitors, which actually I wouldn't speak poorly of. We, we, we sort of have... We have an attitude of abundance instead of... Yeah. Um, worrying about there's enough room in the sandbox right dude there's billions of billions of people that need to get strong and so um yeah absolutely um yeah i I, I think online coaching is a huge multi-billion dollar business or Mm -hmm. industry for most of the time that means paying somebody 50 dollars for a program and i would argue that's not coaching you know if you were like if you were going to go if you wanted to learn how to shoot guns and you would hire a tactical instructor and he sent you a program on how to shoot yeah. your guns like that's not really coaching he didn't well, teach me and it's the same thing here giving somebody a bible is not discipleship either that's exa- that actually is a perfect example that's exactly yeah. right and so for that's us really yes we of course we program for our clients so we don't use templates we don't do cookie cutter stuff everything's personalized but the money the real like the, where the bang for your buck is is that you interact with your coach three four days a week every week and they fully break down your videos and they talk to you like i talked to my clients i got up early this morning i do it every morning at 5 a.m broke down all my videos and I'm speaking to my clients as if I'm having a call with them. Yeah. I record my screen. They get to see, they hear me talk over their squats and their deadlifts. I upload it to them. And then they, and then they get up every morning and they're like, Oh, it's like Christmas. I get to hear what my coach said to me. And there's a couple That's really cool. And- yeah. Cause if I cool. leave the gym with my trainer and I forgot what he said about something, I'm, I'm lost. But with your situation, I mean, someone could technically play it recorded. back. I That's can exactly right. Re- yeah, and they do all the time. Re- Remember, our, yeah. our best clients will play back their feedback in their next workout from their previous workout. And remember, oh, yeah, coach told me to do this. Oh, perfect. Yeah. You know, I was on my toes. I need to get back on That's my heels great. a little bit, whatever. And so, yeah. So then what I guess a big, broad question, because this could be a thousand different things, but just kind of generally speaking, uh, what does good look like? Is it someone hires a coach of yours oh, yeah. for six months and then they're able to continue on their own? Sure. Like, what does good look like? Well, we, we mark progress. First off, we're coming back to what I said at the very beginning of the show where I'm a, you know, I was wired towards the stats, the stat yeah. lines and the data. We collect so much data to make sure that our clients are, are, and we collect aggregate data that we will publish sometimes, but nobody has access to your private data other than you and your coach, which is actually really cool too. But here's the thing. So we track compliance at seven days, 30 days, 90 days and lifetime. So I know exactly your percent compliance. Not just how many of the workouts you did, but how many of the specific exercises that were prescribed to you, sets and reps. I know exactly what your compliance percentage is for every client that I have, right? And so if compliance starts to fall off, we know that's a red flag that somebody might be getting ready to quit or they need a, we need a Zoom call to say like, hey, can I help you get back on the, you know, on, on the, on the yeah. wagon? And so, so we'll do that. The other thing is we track PRs, what's personal records, what some people yeah. call PBs, yeah. but personal records on every lift every exercise for every set and rep scheme. So I know what your five rep max, your three rep max, your one rep max is for all the lifts, your three sets of 10, your four sets of four. Our app automatically tracks that. And then it gives you a congratulations every time you hit a new PR. So you might not even know, oh, I just hit a four sets of four PR, but you're like, yeah, in the Apple, so you did just hit a four sets of four PR, which is really cool too, because that gives you that little dopamine hit. We're constantly chasing getting better. And so there's a day for me, I was a professional strongman. And, um, and I didn't, um, I'm probably not ever going to hit another huge PR. I'm not going to deadlift 800 pounds. I'm 43 years old, yeah. uh, but I can hit a, a post 40 PR mm. post 40 year old PR on the deadlift, or, uh, I can hit a body weight PR or a waist measurement PR, or we track all those things. And so, um, you know, that's what I love. So for us, we're constantly tracking progress. If we can show our clients yeah. progress then they're going to, they're continuing to prove. And for some of them, that progress is literally just compliance. Sometimes yeah. we celebrate like, hey, you did 20 workouts in a row without missing a single workout. That's a new record. Yeah. And for, for your business executives, they're traveling all over and they're trying to train not just in their home gym, but also in like, like hotel gyms. Like yeah. that, a lot of times that is the driving metric that keeps them making progress. In the beginning, that's really maybe forever, but certainly in the beginning, compliance, so consistency and technique are the two big things. It's actually less about the program. Program yeah. matters for sure. But that consistency and technique, those are the things yeah. that really bring about excellent progress. Well, that's that's really cool. And and the great thing about your model is you don't have a whole lot of inventory. Like you're not 
producing yep. a widget, right? Like you're, That's correct. it's all conceptual knowledge and experience and interaction, yep. interface communication. Uh, ever thought about coming out with a, a supplement line or is there just too much nope. out too saturated? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just not a, I'm just not a retail guy. So our next yeah. step for us is we, our software. So it's been going six or seven years. We've been doing this almost seven years now for online coaching. And um, we have really, I mean, I don't want to say perfected, but nearly perfected the online coaching system. Mm -hmm. And so we are now about to license out that online coaching system to other strength coaches, to other coaches out there in the ether, in the industry. Yeah. And so that's the next step for us. So I, I'm, and that's called, you know, it's a software as a service. So they get access to our software and our, and our app and our dev team and our customer service and our payment processing and all that kind of stuff. So other coaches yeah. that are out there, but like, I'd love to do this, but I don't know how to start. Cause by the way, personal training is terrible for the coach too. If you have to, if you have to train 10 people in a day, that's 10 hours of being on being personable, high fiving people. Like it's, that's a grind. Yeah. You can't ever leave. You can't go on vacation. If you do go on vacation, you don't get paid. Yeah. And so that's the next step for us. And so, yeah, I mean, we're just not, cool. we, I mean, we have cool retail stuff at the, at the Barbell Logic store. You could buy all the swag and the hats and the, and the shirts and the stuff. But for us, that's more of a marketing cost. we make almost no money on that because sure. for us, it's all about the service. And, and then yeah. the, the last thing I'll, I'll say that I think is important too, that I always try to send people to is we make a ton of really high end content and the content's all free. And so we've got a huge YouTube channel with every how to like how to anything, how to squat, how to every, every variation on the squat bench, deadlift, all the accessory movements. We have how to videos, how to program, what the program should look like. That's on YouTube. We have one of the biggest uh, podcasts in fitness, the Barbell Logic podcast. Mm -hmm. We have tons of great articles and eBooks. Uh, you can download those on this. And because I'm not a content company, the content's always free. And so for us, we try to send people there first and let them learn about us and establish us as experts in the industry. And some of those people will filter through and become paying clients. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, if you want to sign up for it, great. Like I said, your first month is always 100% free. But the first place mm -hmm. I'd send people is just like, start checking out the content on Barbell Logic YouTube channel or the podcast. Good. Yeah. And barbelllogic.com and website. That's right. Okay. Barbelllogic.com. Yep. And you, by cool. the way, a great place of, to start if you're like, I don't, I would love to start strength training. I don't know where to go. Go to barbelllogic.com slash life, L-I-F-E. And there's a, a free ebook you can download there called The Life of Strength or A Life of Strength. And it talks about how you can incorporate strength training into your everyday life that's geared a lot more towards your listeners. But I think it's a great place to start. That's great. No, it's been a wealth of knowledge. Thank you for doing this. I, yes, uh, man, hopefully maybe some time we can bring you back on because there's a lot of other places we could go to. And for I appreciate sure. your perspective on fatherhood and just masculinity and, and oh, by the way, the wealth of knowledge you are in strength training because I gained a lot of knowledge today. So I know the listeners did. So thank you for making time for us uh, on such short notice. But anyway, uh, with that, he's been Matt Reynolds. We've been like, Last in line, be blessed. Make your escape.